We sang a song this morning, um, Because He Lives. How many of y'all like that song? <clears throat> well, we sang He Lives. We sang He Lives. And, um, and I am grateful that He Lives. Uh, Bill Gaither is the one who wrote the song, Because He Lives. And, and I love that song, too. Because He Lives, I can face tomorrow. But because He Lives, uh, He will be with me today. You know, the Christi Christian life is not just something that's uh, taught to us by our parents. It's not just a, a bunch of rules and regulations to go by. And I forgot my water. All right. <clears throat> I'm in pretty good voice today. Until about 10 minutes ago, I got to coughing. <clears throat> but I should be fine. <clears throat> um, what's so good about being a Christian? If, if, there's, if there's not just some reason why we have Christianity, if it's just a, something that was handed down to us like a bunch of rituals, like you know, just family traditions, that, that, that don't work. When you get in tough spots in life and you get through difficulties, that's not going to help. I mean, we need something that is alive. And because He lives, we've got something special. We've got something that, there's, there's something that is wonderful about Christianity. The plans of God are perfect. They are good. He, he watches over us. He takes care of us. Before the foundation of the world, Jesus knew that he'd have to go to the cross of Calvary, and he was good with that. And he did. He humbled himself. And he came to earth to die the sinner's death so that we could have new life. And when he rose from the grave, everything changed. Everything changed. My wife and I were talking about a, a friend that doesn't know Christ. He's in his 70s. And he's one of those people that every day he wakes up, he makes up his mind what he's going to do that day. He, he's going to make up his mind, you know, well, this day he's going to do this. The next day he's going to do that. I mean, he just changes his mind like, the, like a blowing of the breeze. Anxiety up, anxiety down. Top of the world, bottom of the cliff. Just always going on it and having nothing really to hold to. I don't want to live like that. I want to have something that, that I can grasp and hold and keep and be sure. There's something that is special about being a Christian. It's not just coming to this building. It's having Christ with you. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says this. I have been crucified with Christ. Old King James says, nevertheless, I live. But it's, New King James says, it is no longer I who live. But listen to this now. But Christ lives in me. That's a difference. In the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. My life that I now live is because of what Christ did. Now, this is hard to imagine. This is hard to, to, to take in. But Christ, when I got saved, Christ lives in me. He's the God of all, the eternal one. But He is Spirit as well. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And when I trusted Him as my Savior and Lord, He gave me the very Spirit of God. Today I have breath in my lungs. I have blood that flows through my body. My mind has thoughts that run through it. But because I have Christ, listen, because I have Christ, I've got the breath of God flowing in me. I've got the pureness of the blood of Christ flowing in me. I've got the Spirit that's there to lead my thoughts. I'm not on my own. I've got a God who is able and willing to be there for me. The Spirit of God overcomes the resurrected life of Christ, makes me alive within me. Romans chapter 5, excuse me, Romans chapter 6 says this in verse number 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, that means salvation, folks. If we've been united together in the likeness of his death. And we've had baptism last week. We're going to have baptism next week. That's a picture. After a person becomes saved, 
They, they, they say, I need to make a public profession of what Christ did for me. It shows the death going under the water, the burial, dying to the old way, raised to walk in, listen, newness of life, Christ in you. If you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, it's no longer you. It's Christ in you. So he says, if you have been united together in the likeness of his death, certain we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Folks, I don't know that y'all have heard this, but Jesus is alive and well. They ran to the tomb. He was not there. The earthquake rolled it away. The ones that were placed there to guard the tomb, they had to go confess that, that he was gone. They were bribed to tell a story that, that oh, the, 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 his disciples came and took him away. Yeah, right. He is alive. And he showed himself over and over and over again. But let me tell you the great thing. He showed himself to me. And I prayed that he showed himself to you. I've never heard an audible voice. Anybody here heard? Well, I'm not talking about the squeaking door or your wife hollering at you from across the house. I've never heard an audible voice of Christ, but I can tell you I've heard him speak to my spirit. And he does. Church, listen, he's alive. He's alive. We don't serve a dead God. Mohammed is dead, and he's not coming back. Confucius is dead. Buddha is dead. Christ is alive. It makes all the difference. Now, if I didn't know him, if I couldn't walk with him, I wouldn't know any difference from them. They, they, they say, oh, I'm following the Spirit too, but Christ has made himself known to me. Listen to what it says here. We've been raised in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. You don't have to be controlled by the temptations of this world. You don't have to be controlled by the ways of this world. You can have power over that. You can have power over that. He says, for, we, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Praise God. He says, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, that the life that he lives, he lives to God. Listen, Jesus is alive now, living for the goodness of the Father. Jesus is there for us, and we too are to live to God, not to ourselves. So many people who confess themselves are Christian are still under the weight of the world because they have not died to the ways of the world. And they're not trying to live for God. There's this battle that goes on within. Are they in control? Or are they willing to submit to God and let God lead? Are they willing to follow the things that they want to have to bring them life and peace? Or are they going to follow God's way? I think we could probably hear about a hundred different testimonies of people who've tried it their own way. Y'all know what I mean when I say dead end road? When I was a kid, we had cartoons on Saturday morning. Y'all young people, y'all don't realize that because y'all got cartoons 24-7. They even have a cartoon network. When I was a kid, if you wanted to see cartoons, you had to get up on Saturday morning. Can I get an amen? Yeah. See, some of y'all knew Bugs Bunny. Wiley Coyote. How many of y'all remember Wiley Coyote? Did he ever get it right? I mean, Wiley Coyote was always blowing up something, and it was usually himself. And he would roll this boulder to the top of the hill, and he was going to roll it down the hill on the road runner, and hot, somehow it always came back and fell on him. If that's your Christianity, oh, help me. If all you are doing is being overcome, you don't know the overcomer. He makes everything new. He makes everything full of life. He says he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourself to be dead and be to sin, 
but alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me go back to the verse 4 because I think verse 4 makes it so wonderful. Listen, are you there? Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We should walk in newness of life. Anybody here up for joy? Anybody would like to have a double portion of peace? Anybody would like to have a love that doesn't go away every time you hear bad news? Is anybody looking for something that's bigger than this world? His name is Jesus. And He'll be there for you. He'll help you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, it says this, For though He was crucified in weakness, it was, wasn't it? The crucifixion was tough. Crucifixion was invented by the Persians. It was perfected by the Romans. In Rome, they wanted to make sure that everybody followed the law. So if you broke the law, they were going to punish you publicly. So they would crucify you. They would kill you in a way where they put, on a, put you on a public road. They'd take all your clothes off. They would nail you to the cross. And you would usually stay there three or four days. Make a public example of you. Your body would become so weak that you would have to push up with your feet just to get a breath. And you would hang in the feeling of that tension there. He died in weakness. Now, with Jesus, they beat him to a pulp before he ever got up there. They beat him with rods. They beat him with their fists. They spit in his face. They cursed him. They pulled out his beard. They did everything that they could to, me, to humiliate him. He had to carry his cross up the hill, but he, the, the load was too heavy. He was so physically drained, he couldn't even carry his cross up the hill. So someone else had to carry it up the hill. Don't you know Christ would have, if he had the power, he'd have carried it all the way up the hill. But he was willing to die in weakness. The God of creation, out of love for you. It says to us that Though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. It was the power of God that raised him, but it didn't raise him to leave him. It raised him to abide in him. When you get saved, you get your blood is as pure. The sin is separated as far as the east is from the west. You are made righteous. I'm not worthy to be in the presence of God. But because Jesus cleansed me, I'm white as snow. He cannot have a relationship with me if I was still in sin. But he cleansed me so that I could, I could be loved upon just the same way he loves Jesus. Raised to walk in the power of God. Folks, if you're a defeated Christian, you need to plug in to the power of God. I got a friend here today, Casey, sitting back there in the blue shirt. Wave your hand, Casey. I'm going to embarrass everybody. Casey y'all, gives a great illustration. He'll tell a story, and he'll, he'll go in there with his power tools, his power saw or something like that, and he's like, this thing's not working. He's like, he said, I don't know why it's not working. Somebody will say, you need to plug it in. Y'all hear me? Are y'all plugged in? Listen to this verse once again. Though he, was, though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God. And it says those last two words, towards you. But that's Paul talking to the Corinthians. He says the power of God is given, is given to me so that I can help you. We have Access. I don't know if you're ready for this or not, but I believe the Word of God is true. And it's the fault's not in me. It's not in the Word of God. It, it's we need to accept what the Word of God says. We have access to everything that Jesus was allowed to have access. Yes, 
God's power is at work. By the way, we still have to do His will. Y'all good with that? God still works in His time. He's never early, is He? And, and not only is He able, He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above. And He's working all things together. I, I've been preaching now 36 years. And um, when I was a young preacher, man, I, I, I had all the passion and all the fire. I was in my 20s. And I, man, I just, I was going to save the world, right? And now I've been, come to this place in time in my life where this thing happens and that thing happens. And you know, I've just sat back and I'm like, you know, he's got this. He's got this. And by the way, I've also learned he really doesn't need my help. I'm just here for him. You know, my wife and I were talking, and she said she was praying for me, and I'm like, thank you. I appreciate it. We've been praying for my voice. Y'all been praying for my voice? I appreciate that. I'm, I got the best voice I've had in, what, about five or six months? It's pretty good. But I told her, I'm like, listen, all I can do is speak the Word of God to people's ears. Nothing's going to happen unless God speaks to hearts. I take zero credit. But when God speaks to hearts, the power and the will, the understanding and the knowledge, the blessings and the peace, and the love of God comes in a way. Anybody hungry today? I'm tired of my way but I'm hungry for the ways of God. Let me tell you what God's Word says. <clears throat> In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, it says, Therefore He, Christ, is also able to save, I love this word, to the uttermost. Save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him. Since He always lives, to make intercession for them. What's God doing now? Well, the Father's there in heaven. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit has been sent to this world. So Christ is watching. And by the way, He knows what's going to happen before it happens. He knows what's around the curve. He knows the results of our bad decisions. And His love is there. Praise God, He can protect us from our own stupidity. God is there. God is love. God is working all these things together in an amazing, powerful way. But He's there to make intercession, to intercede. Did you know Jesus prays for you? Do you know that Jesus is the biggest cheerleader you've ever had? He's cheering you on. When you fall, He's not there to criticize and critique and, and complain. And He's there to lift you up. He's there to help you. He's there to strengthen you. He's there to comfort you. He intercedes. This is the greatest picture I have of it. God the Father. Jesus grabs a hold of the Father. And by the Holy Spirit... He grabs a hold of us and He intercedes on our behalf. Have y'all ever felt that? Do you know that? You can. The Word of God says it is true. I love that. He does it to the uttermost. He cares. He always wants God's best. And He stands in the gap for us. Revelation 1 John the Apostle was on the Isle of Patmos. He'd been exiled there for preaching the gospel. They couldn't figure out what to do with John. They, they put him in a, in a big old thing of boiling oil. How would y'all like to die that way? They dipped him down in that burning oil. Only thing about it was, God wasn't going to let him die because God wasn't through with him. What do you do with somebody, you put them in Berlin oil and can't kill them? You put them on an island out there by themselves. 
If we just take away anybody he can preach to, he won't be a threat to us. But on the Lord's day, Jesus shows up to encourage him. And in John chapter, or excuse me, Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, Jesus himself spoke to John and said this: Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives. Aren't you glad he lives? Aren't you glad he lives? I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Then he throws in this word, amen. That word means it is true, so be it. He said, I was dead, not dead. I am alive forevermore. And listen to this. And I have the keys of hell and of death. He's got the keys of life. He's got the keys of death. Now, how many of you know all of us are going to face death? Jesus talked a lot about death. Jesus taught more about hell than he did heaven. He didn't tell us everything about it. I don't know that there's any way that our human mind could comprehend something so terrible. But please hear this. He said, you don't have to go there. He said, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Loneliness and despair, but you don't have to have that. I've got the keys, folks. He said, I, 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 can, I can open a door. Revelation 3.20 says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He comes to knock in your heart's door. This is what I know. When he knocks, you'll know. And we knock, when he knocks, you'll know it's him. He has a way of getting our attention. He says, I stand at the door and knock. He doesn't kick the door down and walk in. He doesn't force them. But he says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, one of the greatest promises in all of Scripture, he said, I will come in to him and dine with him, fellowship with him. And he with me. The problem is we got to open the door of our heart. And if we open up the door of our heart, he'll open up the door of heaven forever. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place, listen to this, for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. When God knocks, He says, I want to come in. I don't want to just spend time with you. I want to spend eternity with you. The most beloved verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish everlasting death, forever be separated from God, to never know the depths of His love, to never know the sweetness of peace, to never have Joy unspeakable and full of glory. But he says, you will not have to perish, but you can have everlasting life. That word not only means life as we know it, that means that we have that breath within us again. We have the, the newness of life, but it means the fulfillment of all of life, the uttermost of life, the greatest of life. And that's when he brings in this word everlasting that's the same word that talks about Christ when he said, has no beginning and has no end. Eternal. He was not created. He is 
all existing. And he brings us into that. Now, hold on. If he brings us into that, we have no more worries about tomorrow. We have no more fears about yesterday. We're brought to a place where we cannot be separated from the presence of eternal God. No sin can get to us. Death can't get to us. Hardship can't get to us. Fears are gone because we're brought into everlasting. I've told this story when I was a kid. That's the word that scared me to death because I couldn't understand it. I didn't know if I wanted to go to heaven, even if it was going to last forever. I'm like, no, I don't know. Because I could, I said, it, maybe it lasts 10,000 years and comes to an end and I'll, I'll have this great time for 10,000 years and then I, th then I won't have to worry about this forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. But if you've heard my testimony, my dad said to me, my earthly dad, said, son, when you get to heaven, it's going to be great. Yes, sir. When you get there and you enjoy it, you won't want to leave, will you? I don't guess so. Then he gave me that great wisdom. Well, quit worrying about it. You know what? He was right. And I gave my heart and life to the Lord the next Sunday night. Anybody in here ever made a mistake? Nobody raised their hand. Choir? No, nobody raised their hand in the choir. Nobody's made a mistake. Well, let me. I'll raise everything I got. But I'm not judged by that. I'm loved through that. He's my own. He's my own. Y'all got children? Hold on, let's make it better. Y'all got grandchildren? You love them? Sometimes you want to kill them. But you love them. How many of you would take your place for them? How much more would God? That's exactly what He did for us. He took our place. The youth used to sing a song. Was it big house? The father's house. He's got a big house. What? How does it go, Jody? Yeah. For all of you who are watching online, I'm sorry you didn't hear that. It was really good. Um, man, it's going to be fun. And I'm going to spend every breath I have, however much time God gives me, and I want to tell everybody that Jesus loves you. This I know. And I want to tell you that He has a place that He's prepared for us. And I don't want you to miss it. And when we get there, it's going to be so much fun. And you're not going to want to leave. And you're going to shout. And you're going to sing praise. But until then, there's other people that need that same joy. And by the way, that's what the church is all about. We're here to give the love of Christ. It's not about only what the church can do for you. It's what God can do through you. But church, please hear this. You are important. You're important to Him. You're important to, the, to the, His work. You're important to the lives of this community. We do this together. We are the body of Christ. Bring what you have. Give that. It's enough. He made you with it. You have a voice. Someone will hear. But I say this lastly to you, if the Lord is knocking on your heart's door, would you hear? Would you open the door? Would you let Him come into your life and save you and cleanse you and make you whole? 
Write your name in the Lamb's book of life where you never have to say goodbye to Him ever again.